you can build reference quality studio grade headphones at home. And honestly, they're probably gonna be better than a lot of real studio headphones. Let's talk about it. This is about the Omega Project headphones. If you don't know about that, really quick background is I spent years developing these headphones. I sold them for a year, and at the end of that year, pledged that I would end the project, not sell any more, and then open source the design so you can either build your own sets or so other people can start manufacturing them. This video is the open sourcing part. The rig that I used for all this development is this guy. It's the Bruling Care 4128C Head and Torso Simulator. And the headphone is designed to be as close as possible to a 10 decibel downward slope from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz for this guy's HRTF. A few things to note, there is a GitHub at the link in the video description that has more detail on the specific parts that you will need, the specs of the different materials, and it's also worth noting that this headband is one that I licensed from a, another creator here in the United States. He designed this for me, but this is his design of headband. He machines these, he's a guy out of Texas. So what I'm going to be showing you guys how to make is this, the ear cup assembly, everything that is necessary to the acoustics. And from there, you can put it on literally whatever headband you want. First things first, you are going to want to 3D print the chassis itself. Now, this was originally designed to be an SLS part, and I have since redesigned it to work with FDM printers. In fact, several aspects of the design of this headphone have been redone to make it easier for you to assemble it at home, such as swapping out things for using hot glue or just little things here and there so you can build these a little bit easier. You're gonna need at least these two parts. I recommend slicing them in this orientation. I've just gotten more consistent results that way. It's the actual chassis itself and the driver cap. I also recommend adding in a little bit of extra painted support here near the bottom. I'm gonna get this cleaned up real quick. There we go. That's cleaned up, a little bit of stringing, but it is fine. The first thing I need to do is take this piece and use my adhesive with it. Now you can laser cut this adhesive out. I provided DXF files on the GitHub page for lasers. You could do it with a diode laser or anything else, or you could just do this and cut it out with an X-Acto knife to fit right here over the baffle. Now something to note, when you have this on here, you're going to want to put the piece on, cut out around the edge, and then you're gonna to wanna to cut out all of these individual holes, but you're going to want to make sure you leave it adhesive on these individual pieces right here. So everything that's open, the adhesive will be removed from, but anything where you see a bar or anything like that, that needs to have adhesive on it. Then you're going to take your stainless mesh, this stuff, and you're going to cut it out to the size of this baffle and you're gonna cut a hole out in the middle. I found it's a little bit easier to cut it out, stick it onto the adhesive, and then cut the hole out of the middle. And what you'll be left with is something that looks a lot like this. Plain and simple, nothing crazy going on, just adhesive and our stainless mesh. From there, you're going to want to take this, your little three and a half millimeter, one of your drivers, and some wire, you're gonna to wanna to solder them all together. These are very fragile, so do not touch the surround on this. If you do touch the surround, it gets a little bit crinkled, you can use a little bit of this 3M adhesive and just lightly touch and pull, and you can get those crinkles back out if you're very careful. I'd say you probably want to leave about this long with your wire, some nice, soft, flexible wire. Solder your connections onto here, and by the way, it's going to be like this uh, if you are wondering, so the negative will be on this post right here, and the positive will be on this post right here. And on the actual driver themselves, negative and positive are marked, so this is positive, that's negative. Don't leave your soldering iron too hot, don't leave it on there too long, because you can melt this plastic here, and you can damage the driver too. Be very careful, ask me how I know. From there, you're going to want to take your driver and actually put it in the chassis. Well, you know what, let's do it with this one right here. I'm gonna put it in the chassis, you're gonna have this wire which is connected to here also. So as you put that in, you'll put that in here. This will just fit right through the hole on the bottom. Then you can take the little retaining piece and screw it on. This kind of takes a moment. It's not super easy to do. Oh yeah, there we go. And from there, I would take some glue, like hot glue or something else, and put it in just around this a little bit, just to better hold it in. And you're also gonna wanna do that around the edges of this driver. So all the way around, just a little bit of hot glue all the way around to fill in this gap right here, just to make it airtight. And you'll end up with something that looks 
like this. This is how we redesigned it because hot glue, let's be honest, it's one of the easiest things for people to work with at home. So you just want to get it to where you're not seeing any air gaps around this driver. So you're gonna go on, put it on with your glue gun and then press the glue gun onto the side just a little bit around to smooth it out. And once that's done, you have a driver seated in this chassis. Don't pay attention to that, that's a step later on. And you can take one of your driver caps, you can print them normal or with fuzzy skin, however you want. And this is just a pressure fit. So this will go around the actual driver itself. And that little bit of glue, once it's dried, uh, actually adds just enough friction that it really holds this thing on well. And there you go. But you're not done tuning it yet. You need these. This piece is also on the GitHub. This is just a small 3D printed piece that I put labels inside of. And this needs to go right here. You can cut out a little square of your adhesive, put it right there on the back and put it right here, lined up with the center of it next to the center of this hole, vertically right there. So three and a half millimeters on the bottom. And this is the side that is facing towards the front. So front of your head here, back of your head here, and this plate goes right in here. This plate is not just for the serial number. This plate is actually important for the tuning and for the frequency response. So make sure you put this plate on there even if you don't put a label or anything else there. Next, you're going to need two things. One is a Dakoni LCD Choice suede pad. The other is this piece of foam. This is in the Dakoni foam attenuation kit that comes with a handful of different foams. It's pretty cheap, but this one's hard to miss. It is the softest one out of the pack. It's also um, pretty lightweight, but it's, it's easily the softest foam in the entire pack. This is the one that you're gonna to wanna to use. You can set it right here on top of your ear cup, cut it out to the size of the ear cup, and then take it just like this and press it down inside the pad and it'll fit underneath the lip. And you just do that all the way around, nice and easy. Probably have to go through and work it just a little bit to level it out in there, make sure it's not too wrinkled. And look at that, got your little foam piece right in there. And then this just fits right onto the pad lip all the way around. If you really wanna make it easier, you can take your fingers, stick them in here, and you can push out just a little bit on this inside of the pad and get it right around that ring. And then twist this however you need to to get it in place. And something else worth noting, when you're putting Omega on a headband, there's two other parts. One is this. This is to stop Omega from rotating too much. It's just gonna clip right in here, it goes on the backside. Omega should fit like this. Top hole here, middle hole on the opposite side. The bottom holes are for retaining this piece in with the middle one. Then you use the middle and the top holes to actually hold the headphone on. Now you see there's a pretty big gap here. Why would I want that? Well, it's so that if you have a wide head, the headphone can do this this ear cup can actually swivel out into the yoke a little bit. Now you could use different yokes, different headbands. Um, you could adapt this onto an MDR7506 headband. You could adapt it onto an HT600, whatever you're feeling. Regardless, those are the connection holes I designed for it to work with. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to 3D print that piece. You can use whichever holes you want. You can modify the cup. You can make and sell your own headphone. That is all up to you. In fact, everything from here on out is up to you. I have made this project. I'm very, very happy with how it turned out. And now it is something that I am giving to the community as I said I would. So what are you gonna do with Omega? I mean, realistically, someone could probably injection mold these parts and make it significantly cheaper than I made it. I was making it with SLS to try and make it as light as possible, still strong and with minimal parts for the construction. But you could probably do it injection molded. It would be a little bit heavier, a little bit more complex on assembly, but it's totally doable. Something worth knowing, you technically only require two drivers for this project, but I would get a handful because they are quite fragile and I channel matched my drivers when I was building Omega. So you may want to try channel matching drivers or at least testing a handful of drivers to see how well they match up before assembling them. I imagine if you just get an average pair, the matching won't be enough for people to notice there being a notable channel imbalance. But if you can get multiple, it's probably worth doing that just to uh, weed out any inconsistencies you may have between the drivers. And that's that. Here's an example of a cool project. This is something that I've just been building for fun in my free time. And this is another thing based off the design of Omega. 
It's a platform that I really think you guys can do a lot with, especially the people who tinker and really make cool stuff in the audio community. So with my blessing, go out, take this project, and make something cool, make something that sounds good. And in the meantime, I'm gonna get back to reviewing. I've got some more projects I'm working on here, as always, trying to set up a spherical array, trying to measure the HRTFs of more measurement rigs and people. It's going to be a very, very interesting next few years. So thank you to everyone who supported this project. It's been an incredible learning experience, and I'm really, really, really proud of the product I made over that one year. I'm gonna wrap this up, but if you build something with Omega, please tag me, wherever it is, if it's on Reddit or Twitter or Instagram, whatever it is, I might not see it on Twitter, but if you build something cool with Omega, tag me. I would love to see it. Till next time, peace.